Thank you, uh, Tyler, and thanks Red Hat for sponsoring. And thank you all for joining this, uh, this session where we're gonna talk about service mesh and multi-cluster, multi-deployment of, of the service mesh. And we're gonna go through this from a, uh, like, like what, what are the problems that we're trying to solve type lens. And we'll look at some of the foundational pieces of how one would solve this and where the service mesh comes in and provides value. So let's get started. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a demo at the end. Please ask your questions in the in the Q and A section of the the Zoom meeting here. And uh, just to give you a little background, my name is Christian. I work at a startup called Solo.io. I used to work at Red Hat. Uh, I was the chief architect of cloud native application architecture, and that's right around when some of the service mesh stuff started to come out. I, I worked with the large cu customers at Red Hat and now here at Solo, adopting cloud native technology, going to microservices style architectures. And more recently, I guess recently in the last three years, um, working with uh, some of the, the next gen application networking technology like like service mesh. So I've, I've written a few books on this on these topics. I'm in the middle of writing Istio in Action, which I've been writing for a couple of years now, but is more recently taking a little bit more momentum. So I think I feel really good about uh, the quality and the direction of the book now. It should come out hopefully in the in the spring. So at Solo, so I, I joined Solo a couple almost two years ago, and the reason I did that is because I thought that building large scale cloud native app, uh, applications and these microservice architectures and so forth, deploying across multiple clusters, multiple availability zones, geographically distributed and so on to maintain things like high availability, to maintain things, to maintain things like localized message processing and data processing and so on, failover and, and being able to withstand those things. That to me, was a much bigger problem that I was interested in working with customers to solve than just saying, you know, service mesh is a check the box for a particular platform. And at Solo, we work with organizations to be able to, to do that. And so this ties into the rest of my talk because the, the, the part that we're gonna be talking about today is sort of in the middle. Uh, between where people get started and they might start adopting some of this technology, you know, deploying containers, deploying into Kubernetes. And then once you've deployed your containers, these services need to talk with each other, right? So on the far left side of this slide, we see that, um, you know, people, people starting to adopt this will start with Envoy proxy, start with a gateway and so on. They'll, they'll slowly move out into a more scaled architecture and might be looking at things like service mesh and, and so on. And then there's things beyond that. Uh, being able to extend the service mesh, maybe being able to program your network um, and building controllers and so on to be able to automatically respond when there's security intrusion or there's, uh, you know, you're doing a new release or you need to do some advanced debugging and so on. So the service mesh and these capabilities that we're gonna be talking about in general, but what we're doing at Solo, is specifically geared toward how do you how do you get the most out of your your network and abstract that so that you can uh, build higher value on top of that. And so it's all that kind of looks like uh, from from the edge. So we heavily invested in Envoy Proxy. We think Envoy Proxy is the correct technology on which to build this, and that comes in the form of gateways, service mesh, and of course. Running this in a real enterprise, you need some level of management and federation, especially across geographically distributed systems, being able to extend it with things like WebAssembly, and then of course, being able to derive value out of those services and APIs that are running in it. So that's, what, that's why I left and went to Solo and that's sort of my passion and where I work with customers and that is uh, also contributing to some of the patterns and, and things that we talk about today in this session. So let's take a step back and build up to what the, the, the problem really is here. 
as we go to build microservices style architectures, right? and we might, and we want to do that in certain cases as an optimization for teams to be able to move faster and deliver software faster. How can they move without having to synchronize, without having to, um, you know, change a bunch of different services all at once? How, how can they just focus on their particular part of the pie and, and move independently? But when we start to break down services and teams and processes and the organizations around this more self service and self ownership of, of services, we start to create more services and more teams and we have a lot more to manage and deal with. But just the services them themselves when they're communicating and talking with each other, it creates a lot more complexity and opportunities for failure between these services than we've had previously. And so that's where the, the service mesh technology fits and, and the problems that it's trying to solve is how do we have these, these smart proxies or these uh, enhancements of the application without the application even knowing to kind of solve some of the challenges of communicating over the network and doing that securely and doing that reliably and doing that in a way that can be observed so that when things start to go wrong, you can quickly figure that out and, and know where to look and, and start debugging. So there's various service mesh implementations that you'll find there. The interesting common thread between these mesh implementations, at least the ones that we show here, is that they've adopted a particular pattern and a particular technology to be that smart proxy or that, uh, that extension to your applications. So let's take a look at what that is. So in the service mesh deployment, what we, what we do is we inject a, uh, a proxy or an agent that lives with the application itself. And when the application tries to talk out over the network, it's this proxy that's responsible for, or, or it is where we implement the capabilities of a secure, observable, reliable network. And so in this model, the, the traffic is going through the proxy and then going to the outside world. The proxy can capture telemetry. The proxy can enforce things like timeouts and retries and circuit breaking policies. It can do things like enabling mutual TLS between uh, uh, the, the services that are communicating um, I can do authorization checks and that kind of thing. And so when you build a, a topology where all of the application instances have this smart proxy living next to it, then you know, it starts to form a communications mesh. So that's where the term service mesh comes from. Service mesh technology typically provides uh, a, a, a set of capabilities around things like service discovery. So in this model, when the app on the left side is trying to talk to the app on the right side, it's the proxy that actually knows where those apps live, right? So we have service discovery, load, client side load balancing. We can do things like end-to-end -end identity verification and encryption of the transport. We can control the traffic routing between the different services because we have this this smart proxy and smart agent between the, the services. It's highly decentralized. So in this model, we don't have a centralized proxy through which everything flows through for east-west or internal traffic. That might be appropriate at the edge, but for service-to-service -service traffic inside the uh, inside a boundary that that you know you take extra hops just to just to get that. And in the service mesh world here, we we collocate those proxies with the application themselves. And then the last part is the mesh itself, if we come back to this, this diagram, has a, a controller or in you know, networking terms, this is a, a control plane that's used to configure and change the behavior of the networking data plane. So the, the, which, which would be the proxies here. And the interesting part about this control plane is that it exposes an API to the operators, to the users, to the SREs, to the developer teams. It exposes an API that 
it allows you to configure the mesh and do that dynamically. So this can be changed on the fly. So what that means is this API becomes very powerful. This uh, allows you to build all, type, all types of uh, different automation on top of that. And we're gonna take a look at that. Now, part of the challenge is when you look at concrete deployments and how those deployments are influenced by real enterprise constraints, things like compliance, things like, well, the, the process has been set up for, for this. You have DMZs, you have private networks, you have um, existing cons uh, security constraints, you need high availability, you wanna separate teams out for autonomy and isolation and so forth. What we see is more, especially when you're adopting Kubernetes and some of these types of uh, container platforms, that you're we're, we're going toward a, a model where there are more of these smaller clusters and more of these types of deployments, though, which themselves need management and so on. But we're, we're just going to take a look at this from the from the networking perspective. So across multiple deployment targets, which could be clusters, could be availability zones, could be geographically distributed data centers, or it could be on prem versus versus a, a public cloud. The patterns that we're gonna look at here are similar. So when you're trying to cross boundaries, the first pattern that we'll look at is, well, the boundary is a soft boundary and actually all these endpoints can communicate with each other because we're talking over a flat network. And we do run into users and, and customers that, that have this topology, but it's not always that, that common. In this model, it's fairly simple. An account service that needs to talk to a peer service or collaborator service can just call the service directly. They're living in a different boundary, but they're still addressable directly. In a, a, a different model where these are these different clusters, these different boundaries are living in different networks, we can, instead of address them directly over the network, what we can do is set up intermediaries or gateways for each of these services that need to be, um, that you need to communicate with and use those as the endpoints to which these the services. So for example, in cluster one account would talk to a VIP or a gateway um, that would represent what cluster two is that might be in a different network. And then that, that gateway can do the translation to the different network and do the routing correctly. Now this, Pattern is also kind of common. Now in a, in a on-premises or a public cloud setting where spinning up additional load balancers or gateways to handle this type of pattern can become expensive. The, you know, the preference is to go more towards something like this where the traffic is going from one network to the other through a gateway, but that one gateway is responsible for servicing all of the services that might live in that other network. So we don't have this proliferation of load balancers. Now we have a single load balancer, single gateway that is smart enough to do the routing, do the translation, do the security and, and so on. So in the, some of the previous slides, we saw that there's a, what is, what is the role of the service mesh? What are some of the service meshes that exist? We saw Istio and OSM and console app mesh, these types of service meshes. And one thing I said was very common to them. And that was the proxy that they chose to be their data plane is based on the Envoy proxy project. And when we look at starting to try to implement some of these patterns, whether that's with a service mesh or not, doesn't matter. Envoy proxy, it, can become a crucial and a uh, very powerful piece to this puzzle, both in terms of the obvious, which is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it could play the role of a gateway. I mean, it is a proxy, but it, it also has the capabilities to be smart about how to route, when to route um, across multiple clusters between multiple zones and across uh, global data centers and, and so on. So, like I said, Envoy Proxy is a foundational piece to building this type of framework, this type of solution. Envoy is a proxy that implements things like 
zone aware routing, priority and locality lo load balancing, uh, circuit breaking, timeouts, retries, uh, retry budgets. It can collect a lot of telemetry and be very informative about what's happening on the network for a particular application or between applications. It can do things like uh, tracing, uh, distributed tracing and so on. Uh, some of the security properties and so Envoy, Envoy is a very powerful um, piece of technology that is being used very widely now as sort of the de facto standard. If you're going to if, if you're going to look at a service mesh or even build a service mesh, Envoy is your, your starting point. But going back to like how, how this helps in a multi-cluster setting or a multi-zone setting. Envoy is smart about, or can be smart about where its collaborator or peer services live, uh, what zone they live, what sort of waiting or wait routing and so on that they should do, um, and, and plays the role of the sidecar in, in the service mesh model, as you can see here. So in, in those patterns, what that might look like is Envoy living with the applications and Envoy at the edge as, as a gateway. And when Envoy is living with the applications and directing the, the control of, its, uh, of the traffic routing, when, when in, in an example where the account service wants to talk to the user service, Envoy can be smart enough to know, hey, just let's use the one that's local to the, the cluster in which the account service lives already. And if that starts to fail, then spill over to a different cluster, different zone, different data center, uh, and, and also be smart about how you do that. So let's dig into what that, what that means. What, what, what is Envoy, what can it be smart about? What can it do in these types of scenarios where you need high availability, low latency, uh, failover, and, um, and, and security? Some of these other features include doing things some of these advanced things, but like I said, Envoy lives out of process from the application. So from the interaction with the application itself and the operator who's configuring it, it's transparent to the application. The application thinks it's talking over the network, but because of this programmable service mesh, we, we can give it transparently, we can give it additional capabilities like, like some of these. So request hedging or request racing, some of these, these different types of load balancing algorithms, um, being zone aware and so on. So let's, let's take a look at those a little closer. So request racing or request hedging happens when you're making calls. So, so the account service is trying to talk to uh, a peer service and Envoy in a service mesh setting is is you know the, the proxy through which that traffic is, fl is flowing, Envoy can make the call out to that peer service. And if it hits a timeout, what Envoy can automatically do is retry. And that's the normal behavior. If you configure it to retry, if, if, if you hit an error or a timeout or something, we can it automatically retry. Application doesn't even have to know anything about that. Now, what's interesting about request hedging is if we make that retry, but the original request, which timed out, actually returns. So we'll, we'll stay and wait for it. Even though it's timed out, we're not going to close it. We'll stay and wait for it in this model. Um, then we'll, we'll take whichever response is fastest, whether it's the original request that originally timed out, but we're still waiting for, or the retry that we, that we uh, sent out. Right. So now, now you effectively have two requests that are out but whichever one comes back first will uh, we'll respond with that request. So this allows you to work around uh, potentially slow services or intermittently slow services um, and even fail over to or, or try calling other endpoints that might respond faster. So that's one, one of these uh, nice features of Envoy. Another one is giving Envoy enough information up front to know what zone, availability zone or grouping that it lives in and what zone the other workloads that it's trying to talk to live in. And 
knowing that information, when Envoy starts to see degradation or slowdowns or failures of services and, and peer services that it thinks or it knows that it are in its own zone, same zone, then Envoy can automatically make a decision to, all right, let's start spilling over to different zones. And so this is Envoy's zone aware routing capabilities. A variant of that model is instead of Envoy making the decision about how and when to fail over to different zones, what we can do is have the control plane pre-populate -pre what that decision should look like. So what that means is the, the control plane will say, hey, when, it, when it delivers the config to, to Envoy, for in this case, the account server, it can say, when you start talking to these peer services, I want you to give them a priority and a weight different depending on what zone they exist in. And then just you know, follow your, your same failover um, me mechanisms based on the, the priority and the weight that the control plane has given to, to the proxy. So the control plane typically will see more and have a more understanding of what the topology looks like. Uh, it can discover that at runtime and then drive individual configurations for the data plane to, to be aware of, of that information like locality, for example, um, and give it different priorities and different weights based on, based on that. The last thing is, uh, is sort of a, um, a refinement of the previous uh, functionality that we saw with uh, the control plane owning the configuration and the weights and locality and that kind of stuff for the data plane. Uh, this just gives you a little bit more fine grained control over how it calls the different services, potentially in this case, across different zones, different regions and, and globally. So bringing and tying all of this back, what we, and we're gonna use a real example in this case now, we're gonna use Istio, um, you know, tying all these different patterns back to their implementation, what Envoy can do under the covers and what this might look like. So in this, in the first pattern that we saw, we saw two different boundaries on the same flat network and how this would be implemented with a service mesh would be well, you, see, you have the data plane, the, the proxy is living with each of the service instances, and you have a single control plane that knows about the services running in cluster one and cluster two. And since the network is flat, they can directly address each other. So the account service, when it talks to the user service, can talk to the one in cluster one, but it can also talk to the user service that's deployed in cluster two. And the control plane here sees where these deployments live and uses that information to configure the proxies that live in, uh, in each of the data planes. The second option is to have, again, a single control plane and share that control plane across multiple different clusters and multiple different boundaries. And in this model, the traffic flows from cluster one to cluster two, which would be in a separate network through a gateway, as we saw earlier, which would do the handle the translation and you know going from one network to the other. And in this model, the workloads that are running in cluster two share their information with the control plane that's running in cluster one. So this is a this is a, a fine model, I think, to get you know kind of playing around with where you extend things that are living in the same data center and probably in the same zones. But one downside to this model is if cluster one goes down, then you've lost the control plane for your other clusters, right? So you don't have that separation of the uh, of, of your failure boundaries around um, which you typically try to architect for high availability. So if, if one particular cluster me messes up, that affects your other clusters, not ideal. So the, the third option is to have the control planes running in their own failure boundaries. And in this case, it would be per cluster. The control plane is responsible for 
administering the config for the data planes that live in that in its own cluster. Communication is still going through the gateways as it traverses different networks. And in this model, to make each control plane smarter about what lives in the other cluster. So for example, in cluster one, we have an account service and a user service. And the service mesh for that cluster knows only about those services. But there is another user service and it lives in cluster two. So somehow we have to make cluster one and the service mesh there aware of the, the, the presence of the user service in cluster two, how to communicate with cluster two, how to communicate with the user service, what is the right credentials and certificates and MTLS that you can use to make that, that connection happen. So multiple clusters, we talked about why we might wanna do that for various compliance scale and high availability reasons. Um, if we look at the capabilities of something like Envoy, which is very powerful and, and can be very um, useful in this, in this context and kind of bringing that into a service mesh and how do you build and run and deploy that, you can see this gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Uh, now there are no easy solutions to this, but some of the problems that you start to run into when you start to go down this path are around uh, manage, managing these, these things. You have multiple clusters, you have to manage the clusters. You probably, if you're going down that path, you probably have something to manage uh, the GitOps workflows and, and the Kubernetes uh, backup etcds and all that stuff, right? But when you start to go at a little bit a layer higher about what, what are the applications now? Where do they live? What are the failover rules and stuff that we should have here? Um, it's, there's a lot of work that the operator has to do. The operator has to make, make sure that um, each of these clusters and the identities that they provide for their, their workloads that live in each of those clusters is something that can be unified across the different clusters. We need to write configurations in multiple clusters to make each cluster aware of where the other services live. We need to define higher level semantics around failover and localization. What happens, should, traffic should stay local most of the time, but when it fails, how, how should it, or when, when, it should, when it fails over, how should it fail over? Should it fail over to the next locality? Should it fail over to pinned specific clusters for compliance reasons? Um, you know, figuring out what those fault domains are and, and how to administer those. That's, that's a lot of uh, uh, stuff that the operator has to work out. Now, we're working on an open source project at, at Solo called uh, Service Mesh Hub that is intended specifically to solve the difficult challenges around running a service mesh and running it across multiple clusters. And so what Service Mesh Hub does is provide a management plane that basically orchestrates the different independent service mesh control planes, All right? So if you have, if I go to this, this diagram, you have these different clusters, each with their own independent service mesh deployment um, on, on, on multi, so if we see two clusters here, it could be 10, it could be 100. And what Service Mesh Hub does is it discovers the, the meshes that are running there it um, automates the placement of configuration. It provides an API that is multi-cluster aware. So all you see is an API that uh, abstracts away this detail and you deal with what's called a virtual mesh. You write your configurations against a virtual mesh and then Service Mesh Hub ends up translating and orchestrating the configurations in, in the right cluster. Now, what's it, what, what makes this interesting is that but well, in my experience in a real enterprise, uh, you end up getting in a situation where of course you have multiple clusters, multiple, multiple deployments and so on, but you might even get in a situation where you take your on-prem deployments and say, all right, now I'm ready to go to a public cloud. And when you get there, you realize, oh, there's a lot of value that public cloud offers in terms of compute and automation and management. And they have their own service mesh sometimes, and, and it'll, be, it'll be true uh, more in, in the future. They have their own service mesh. AWS has that mesh. Um, so how do you unify 
these networking layers that might run in different clusters and might be completely different implementations. Um, so that that is the goal of where uh, Service Mesh Hub is going to be able to make operating a service mesh in an enterprise large deployment feasible and realistic and, uh, and, and improve that, that experience both from the user perspective as well as the operator perspective. So I have a few minutes here. Let me get, uh, let me get to a quick demo. I'm gonna do the short one here today. So what we have where we're starting is a deployment that looks like this. We have Istio running in cluster one and cluster two. And then we've deployed the service mesh hub management plane into a third cluster. Now, cluster one and cluster two live on GKE. The management plane lives on a kind cluster running on my, on my local machine. So the first thing that, oh, and we're gonna also point out that uh, we have, uh, we'll, we'll follow along in the UI. So there's, it, it, it's you typically interact with uh, service mesh hub through a CLI or through a GitOps workflow. It uses declarative uh, configuration, but there's also a, a read-only UI that we can use to, observe and watch you know, you know, what, what, is, what does the deployment look like. So the first thing we're gonna do is register cluster one and cluster two with the management plane. And so what this is gonna do is allow the management plane to then go discover what are the meshes running there? What are the workloads running there? And what other context lives in that, in that service mesh so that the management plane can be smart about how it orchestrates and controls the rest of the, the clusters. So we registered cluster one. Let's do the same thing for cluster two. We'll give that a second. What it's doing is it's in installing some uh, agents specifically to handle things like security and certificates. Um, and then it's doing the discovery, as I mentioned. The next thing that we wanna do is we want to unify these two different clusters because right now they're two independent service meshes. What we want to do is unify them under a single abstraction, unify the identity domains, unify the configuration API. Um, and we can do that fairly simply with the service mesh hub virtual mesh. So if we take a look at the virtual mesh resource, what we're saying is, hey, include these meshes in this virtual mesh abstraction. These happen to both be Istio. Uh, federate them. So in this case, we're going to supply the service discovery information necessary for both clusters to know about what services live where, right? So the services in cluster two will be made aware to services running in cluster one. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna configure the, uh, the TLS and the identity, the root identity domains uh, it'd be coming from a single root CA in this case. So let's apply the virtual mesh. And now under the covers, what Service Mesh Hub is going to do is it's going to reach out to these different clusters, configure them security-wise and so on, so that they now, when they try to communicate with each other, they appear as though they're one single uh, service mesh. So if we get the mesh, cross our fingers, okay, we see in the status fields that all of the configuration orchestration has happened and it has been accepted. And that's good. If we come over here, we should start to see um, some more information about, we have uh, one virtual mesh, we have two different clusters, we have a bunch of workloads that have been discovered. In this case, the workloads that have been discovered are the, the book info Istio demo that we, that we typically run when, when we look at Istio. So what we've done under the covers is we've created the, a, a root CA and we could have used an existing one. Then what we did is we told the different service meshes you, here, you know, create a certificate signing request or an intermediate certificate for each of the individual meshes that have a root, a common root, a shared root. And then from there, each mesh can go pro provision its own workload uh, certificates and so on, but they all run, you know, they all terminate in the same route. So the, the traffic from one cluster to the other 
should be able to make an end-to-end -end a mutual TLS connection and identity and trust the identity um, between the different clusters without the application having to know or do anything about that. So that looks good. Real quick before we, we continue. So if we look in cluster one, if I get uh, the pod from contact Istio cluster one, we see we have the, the book info demo running, product page details, reviews V1 and V2, which allows us to change the behavior of the app at runtime. On cluster two, we see we have the same app, but we also have reviews V3 running there. So on cluster one, we don't have reviews V3. What we're gonna show in the next part of the demo is how we can route traffic from cluster one to cluster two, achieve a mutual TLS end-to-end -end -end encryption and, um, and, and, and do that using, um, using configuration and using the API to drive that, a de declarative configuration. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at our book info app. If I refresh the book info app here, it is looking at cluster one. We can see that we bounce between reviews V1 and V2. We never see reviews V3, which would be, uh, which would have red stars. We don't see that here as we refresh a few times. Now let's explicitly control the traffic where we are going to say, using our traffic policy, the mesh, uh, service mesh hub API, using the traffic policy, we're going to say, if you try to talk to the review service, and in this case, if you're trying to talk to the review service in cluster one, then let's actually route some of that traffic to V1 of reviews, which lives in cluster one, and some of that traffic to V3, which lives in a different cluster, right? And some of that traffic will go to V2. But the, the interesting point, point here is we're making 75% of the traffic go to cluster two. So if we apply this and cross our fingers, then what we should see under the covers, so let's, let's make sure that we do, that the service mesh hub has orchestrated the different configurations. It's created virtual services, destination rules, service entries, all of these things that are mesh specific, in this case it's Istio, um, but it's configuring it in a smart way such that the workloads can then communicate with each other across the cluster. They can trust their identity and, and everything is under mutual TLS. So if I refresh this and cross fingers, we should see the red stars. Red stars is V3 of reviews. Refresh a few times. We should see 75% of the traffic should go to red stars, but we should also see um, some traffic going to the, the non-red stars, but there, there we go. Um, I'm running out of time. There's more to this, right? Because once you've built, once you have this management plane that is smart about where the workloads live, what are the different control planes, how to configure them on the fly, and you've exposed an API to the end user that is that abstracts away the fact that there's multiple clusters and what, whatever the details of the service mesh, that API that is specific to what the end user is trying to do. Um, then you've built some, you know, foundation for building some uh, powerful capabilities. Like the next in the next section, I was going to show access control or failover and um, and so on. Now the UI is powerful enough that, of course, we can see our different meshes. We see our virtual mesh here. If I look at the the different meshes, we can see what workloads and and traffic targets and policy rules and all, all that kind of stuff. We can also see, if I click on debug, the configurations for the specific meshes themselves. So if we look at cluster one, we can see we have the virtual services, the Istio virtual services that were created. We have some of the service entries that are used to kind of glue this stuff together, uh, destination rules and, and so forth. So let me stop there. I know we have some questions um, and I have about, it looks like five minutes unless I get corrected. Um, oh, five minutes. That's what I was getting ready to jump in and tell you. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me leave this here. So first of all, uh, I, I, I want to thank you for attending. Hopefully this was useful for you. Uh, there's, there's a lot to dig into here.
um, is a pretty exciting way of solving some of these challenges. So please, I, I believe these slides, mm, I don't I can't remember if I posted them already, but if not, then I will post them up on SlideShare. Um, do reach out to me on social media or email or however you would like if you have questions. And the, I've had people come up and ask, hey, is it okay if I reach out to you? Well, I'll come up and ask once I've, when I've done this in, in person. Um, and I've said, yes, exactly. That's why I put my information on here so that you can reach out um, and ask any questions. There are no stupid questions. I know this stuff is, is kind of complicated. Um, please reach out and ask questions. You can dig in um, at these different URLs for more. Go check out the various service mesh communities, the uh, Envoy proxy community, of course, our communities um, around Glue, which is a API gateway built on Envoy, Service Mesh Hub, WebAssembly Hub, and these types of things. Definitely, there's a lot of information out there, but, but reach out if you have questions. So let me take a look at some of these questions. Um, let me see. What's the security risk for having the sidecar handle the MTLS and TLS termination and then having traffic forwarded on the application container over the plain text protocol? Okay, so that's a good question. Let's come back to one of these slides so we can take a, take a deep, uh, uh, take a closer look at it. So the question is, what is the security risk when you're sort of offloading TLS and MTLS to the proxy? And in this use case, the app is talking to the proxy and the proxy then is taking, and that, that could be over plain text, which is what the question said. And the proxy then says, oh, okay, you're trying to talk to host XYZ. Well, when I talk to host XYZ, I'm gonna open up a TLS connection to that. I'm going to send uh, my client credentials because I expect, um, I, I expect a, a mutual TLS connection here. And I'm going to expect the server to send their credentials and you know, I'm gonna verify them and so on. So the security risk here is in, for example, if we're talking about uh, a VM and the proxy lives on that VM, but so does the application lives on that VM. Now the question is, how does the app talk to the proxy? And so the security risk is over that, uh, that communication there. Istio, for example, sets up communication so that IP tables does an automatic redirect to a, a, a port on local host so that all traffic coming from the app should get redirected to the proxy, uh, a, a local host uh, port. Um, so the communication will happen on localhost loopback. So there's there's your, your part of your security risk there. Second part is, well, what if the app somehow circumvents the, the proxy? Right? So how do you lock down the app in terms of how, how and what it's allowed to do uh, when it talks over the network? Now, there are things you can do to mitigate this uh, so for example, you can use Unix domain sockets to talk to the proxy and, and so forth, but that, that's the area in which you want to uh, pay, pay closest attention. Hopefully that helps. Um, is it a sidecar pattern? So I assume they're asked this question is about how the capabilities of the service mesh get implemented in a deployment. And that's when the Proxy is injected, lives next to the application instance. So we talked about VMs a second ago. This, the same thing is true in a Kubernetes context where each instance of your application gets deployed with this sidecar proxy. So yes, yeah, so the pattern that is being used here is, is the sidecar pattern where the app gets deployed as its own container with the sidecar container and in Kubernetes, it gives a not really nice abstraction for grouping those things atomically, um, but the proxy ends up becoming a sidecar there. Um, can we get slides? Yes, uh, the slides will be on my slide share. I can submit them to the conference organizers as well. And I, I'm not sure exactly how that gets, um, gets distributed. Here we have a question. In our environment, we have about 50 backend APIs managed by IBM's Connect, API Connect, and backed by services, routes, and Kubernetes. We aren't load balancing across clusters yet. 
all apps either route from API Connect to one of the clusters or another, depending on where the service is housed. Can you envision how Istio and Service Mesh would function in this, this scenario? Um, and I, I think the answer to this is, yeah. So the, the traffic that you're talking about so far is traffic coming into the cluster and using API Connect to kind of send the traffic off to where it needs to go. Um, and that can be the, the, the discovery of the apps, the health checking of the apps and so on can be improved with something like a service mesh. If you look at our Glue API gateway, we have something called Glue Federation that also works with the service mesh to solve this type of problem. Um, I'll leave the, the link right here. I would, I would say go, go to Glue and, and check the, the federation and the integration with, with service mesh. So I think I'm out of time. Um, I, there's another question uh, from Justin. Let me, let me take that question, copy and paste it, and I will answer that on Twitter. Hey, Christian. Um, yeah, so we are out of time. I, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, however, I think the session after this actually was canceled. So if you want to answer that question oh. live, you can. We have a couple extra minutes that we can spare. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Is, we, just, our next session is not going to be uh, just so that I have correct information for everyone. I believe our next session is going to be at 1.30. Um, the a tour of open source on the mainframe. Okay, awesome. So yeah, then let me ask answer this. So the question is, can you substitute the Envoy proxy that handles north south traffic in the service mission implementation between different clusters with another gateway service like Azure Application Gateway or Kong API Gateway? Um, so the answer is. That's a good question. Um, the gateways that we use in Istio versus the gateways that are typically used for edge ingress, um, first of all, play a different role. So in, in Istio, for example, the gateway is, is, um, is really used just sit to, simply to get traffic into the cluster. Whereas a gateway like uh, Azure API Gateway or, or Glue, for example. So Glue is, a, is another example of an Envoy-based API Gateway that it plays a different role from what Istio's Ingress Gateway does, which is how do we verify the trusted user? Uh, how do we you know, enforce OIDC flows? How do we do things like request and message transformation uh, and decouple the APIs and maybe build an API developer portal and so on? So Glue or you know, Azure or any of these API management vendors, um, that, that's the role of those gateways. Now, the question is, can they play the same role in allowing multi-cluster communication? Uh, the answer is just gonna come down to, when, in, a, in a multi-cluster uh, fashion, what Istio's gateway is doing is fairly simple um, and, and transparent SNI routing. So because we're establishing an end-to-end -end MTLS connection between the workloads in cluster one and cluster two, the, the workloads in cluster one are talking to the endpoint that is really, is really the gateway for cluster two. But all that gateway is doing is SNI routing and sniffing the SNI host and saying, oh, you want to talk to this one. So let's, let's pass through the connection to the, to the, to the actual workload. And the, the workload ends up terminating the, um, terminating the, the connection. So in that case, the gateway can be anything that, that'll do SNI uh, routing. Um, things like Istio Ingress Gateway or Glue, for example, they, you know, that, that can be handled pretty, pretty simply. Um, I, I believe you can do that with some of the other gateways as well. Uh, now, when it comes to automating the, you know, the, a, a large deployment of this, that's where things like a service mesh hub or whatever orchestration you're using, it would be nice to have consistent APIs it would be nice to have consistent implementation of how those gateways are debugged and you know turn on logging and and so on. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why Envoy was was built. I, if you look back at what Lyft did, Lyft built Envoy initially to be sidecar proxy, then realized 
wait a minute, it's hard to manage all these ALBs, all these edge, you know, Nginx and HA proxy and all these different gateways that have different um, you know, operational characteristics and, and debugging characteristics and so, and so on. So just use Envoy in, in, at the edge as well. Uh, but to answer your question, as long as it can do SNI pass through, it might take a little bit of heavy lifting to, to get it all working, but that is the, the technical requirement there. So I appreciate all the questions. I appreciate the folks who, stuck, uh, who stood around and um, uh, first saw the presentation and then afterward for the questions. Just reach out to me if there's other questions. And, uh, and again, many thanks for, for joining.